Um, first of all, just very briefly, let me just go through. Thank you so much, David. That was really nice. And I'm always so happy when people make me a mycologist because <laughs> I'm, I'm not actually a mycologist, but I did have the um, opportunity uh, to study mycology with uh, Dr. Daniel Stuntz at the University of Washington. And I was very fortunate uh, to be there. That was during the uh, late 60s. And um, during that period, I was actually studying anthropology and I was sort of putting anthropology, mycology together, especially, well, what can I say? It was the 60s, magic mushrooms, come on everybody. You know, <laughs> what a wonderful time. <laughs> At any rate, um, after university, I went to Mexico, spent a year and a half down there. When I got back in 1973, I, um, what do you do with a degree in anthropology? Not much, but I thought, wow, can I grow mushrooms? There's only one mushroom farm in, in um, Washington state, in Olympia. I went there, I got a job. I didn't realize later, but it's probably one of the easiest uh, um, businesses in the world to get a job at. Nobody wants to work on a mushroom farm, especially with all that compost there. My God, the odor. Everybody's like, no, I want to get out of here. I was there for 10 years. I, I really loved it. It was just a wonderful experience. And um, that started me off on my career as a mushroom grower. And so that's a bit what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm just going to sort of give you an overview of um, uh, mushroom farming, what it looks like. How many people here have actually ever been to a mushroom farm? Anybody? Ah, wow. That is wonderful. A, a, a Garricus farm only or beyond? Ha <laughs> ha, Paul, of course, should have known. <laughs> anyway, uh, David, um, just to make sure, I um, just want to make sure that I am able to, okay, good, I can share my screen. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll get rolling on this presentation. Okay, I am screen sharing. That's interesting. And just going to do this and I'll get rid of that. Well, um, I guess everybody knows that mushrooms are fungal organisms and they're consumed as food, supplements and nutraceuticals. Um, I started out growing mushrooms for food. What a wonderful thing. Um, as you know, mushrooms have been consumed for millennia and actually I just saw. So let's go back here and um, I was just going to say, I just read a paper that said that a, on an archaeological dig in China uh, in 7000 BCE, they actually found Ganoderma spores in this uh, uh, dig, this midden that they were looking at. I thought, wow, that was pretty interesting. But anyway, we've been consuming mushrooms for a long, long time, and, and we actually started cultivating mushrooms systematically about 800 years ago with shiitake mushrooms in China, um, 12th century. They, they started cultivating shiitake. Uh, in Asia we've, Asia, we've got about two dozen different mushrooms cultivated for food. So in the supermarkets in Asia, we've got um, at least uh, a dozen that you could buy at any time. And then traditional Chinese medicine has been using mushrooms for uh, thousands of years and currently mushrooms are being sold worldwide as supplements. Now, most of you know about mushrooms and their nutritional value. I, I think it's really important that people understand that because, you know, when I was first went to work at the mushroom farm in 1973, traditional nutritionists basically said mushrooms have no food value. Uh, and why did they say that? low in calories. If you're, the food doesn't have any calories, it's like it's a non-food and that's what they thought. But uh, again, now, first of all, when, I, when I'm ta um, talking about this here, every single mushroom is a little bit different. So that's why we've got ranges here, but a moderate pro protein, high in fiber. And this is really important. Um, mushrooms contain a lot of fiber. A lot of it is due to the presence of chitin, makes it a little bit 
uh, less digestible than most other foods, high in carbohydrates, um, mannitol, trehalose, beta-glucan. Mannitol is actually a really interesting carb. It, it is a slow digesting carbohydrate. They uh, use mannitol in a lot of ways for people with uh, um, weight problems. But anyway, it's a kind of a slow acting carb, low in fat. Um, B vitamins, B1, 2, and 3, thiamine, riboflavin, and niacin, and mineral-wise mushrooms are high in potassium and phosphorus. Um, and then the other mineral profile of mushrooms pretty much depends on what they're growing in. Now, what's really interesting is that uh, China right now produces more than 85% of the world's mushrooms. 85%. It's just absolutely incredible. And that's, that's come about over just the last 40 years. Uh, 1978, 5%. Uh, 2011, more than 85%. So one, one of the things that's going on here is that China has abundant agricultural wastes. They have decentralized uh, farming there. They have tens of thousands of small mushroom growers. And it is a very good cash crop for uh, the Chinese people. They have a lot of mushroom research institutes. When I've traveled around China, I visited probably half a dozen different research institutes. In the United States, there is one university in the United States that had actually a mushroom uh, component to it. Um, that was Penn State University because of the large mushroom growing industry in Pennsylvania. Today they have, uh, when, when I first, first started growing in the 70s, there was maybe 12 scientists there that were, were dedicated to mushroom growing. Today there's maybe one or two. Um, so they're very supportive of uh, their agriculture there. Uh, you know, the, the population alone means that they're gonna have a tremendous number of scientists working on in any given area. They have a highly organized and efficient workforce. And as a commercial mushroom growing, and with my background in that, um, one of the things that I realized very early on when I decided to move from growing mushrooms for food and instead actually growing mushrooms and producing uh, powders for supplement use is that you cannot grow mushrooms in the United States or North America and put them into the supplement market. And it's really fairly simple. Um, for one, growing mushrooms is not cheap. Um, fresh shiitake, we could get $5 a pound wholesale for fresh shiitake. Uh, and then, you know, you'd be paying a lot, $15, $20 a pound retail, but $5 a pound wholesale, mushrooms are 90% water. Uh, that means that that same pound of shiitake, you're going to have to get $50 for that same pound of shiitake supplements or dried powder. So one kilo, dried kilo of mushrooms would sell for about $110 wholesale to somebody that wanted to turn it into a supplement. The economics just simply do not work. And for that reason, I went to China and my first trip over there was in 1989 to a, a conference, International Society for Mushroom Science Conference. And during the whole of the 90s, I traveled all throughout China, um, research institutes, conferences, farmers, processors, and made a lot of contacts and realized that the only way that I could bring supplements to the, to the North American market was to grow my mushrooms in China. Now, I really believe in organic certification. And, and of course, you know, everybody right now, I mean, there's a big thing about, oh, you know, I wouldn't eat anything from China and so on. But the fact of the matter is, is that you can either work with them or there wouldn't actually be any actual mushroom supplements in the United States. So in 1997, I took OCIA with me. We did the first organic uh, uh, workshop for mushrooms in China, 1997. Now, when, when I do talks for people, I, I'm, I'm always explaining this chart to them because in the 
the herbal supplement market, um, when you're buying a supplement, it's like, okay, what, what am I buying? Am I buying a root? Am I buying the leaves? Am I buying the fruit? Um, what part of that plant, which the most of the supplements are some plant, what part of the plant am I purchasing? Because that will really have a big effect on the actual medicinal compounds that are in this particular plant. So it's, it's no different really with mushrooms. And so again, we have to look at what part of this organism are we actually supplying to the marketplace and, and I've just boiled it down to three what I call plant parts, which is what we say in the, the industry, because most of the herbs that are being sold out there as supplements are green plants. And um, the plant parts here would be spore, mycelium, and mushroom. And each one of those is used uh, in the supplement industry. And interestingly enough, today in China, uh, reishi mushroom spores are actually more valuable than the reishi mushroom itself. Um, personally, I, I don't really see the value in spores, but over there they've turned it into a really uh, big business. Um, so, growing mushrooms. <laughs> what do we use a seed to grow a mushroom? <laughs> mushrooms don't have seeds. Well, um, Mushroom growing seed is actually a live culture of pure mycelium. So how do we actually grow that? What do we do to, to create that? Well, um, we can ev either get a culture from the germination of spores, like a multi-spore culture, or we can get, uh, uh, get a culture from a tissue of a fresh mushroom. So a live mycelium culture is grown out on various carrier materials because it's it, you can't just take mycelium and grow it out and then somehow plant that so we have to actually put that on some type of carrier in in historically they might use uh, whatever uh, the it was growing on they might dig it up and that was called virgin spawn they dig up a patch of agaricus mycelium where it was growing and they they'd break it up and plant it in their beds or or with shiitake they might actually get shiitake mushroom and put parts of it into a log. But ultimately, um, we've been able to use materials that are better for that purpose. And ultimately, what we are creating is what we call mushroom spawn. And uh, grain is a very common uh, carrier for uh, a spawn that's made uh, for agaricus mushrooms and oyster mushrooms, and that grain has to be sterilized. We, we literally, when, when you're in pure culture, you cannot put mushroom mycelium into a material and have it compete. We have to sterilize that material to kill all our other organisms, whether it's bacteria, other fungi, otherwise it'll spo spoil the culture. Here, that sterilized grain is being inoculated. Um, they inoculate that, then, then down they will seal off this particular bag of grain. They'll put it on a cart. Uh, ultimately, that cart goes back into a room where that grain will be incubated. And um, over the course of approximately um, three weeks, that grain will be fully colonized. And once it's colonized, that's what we would call grain spawn. And, and, and again, it's just basically grain that's been soaked with water to about 50% uh, moisture content. We inoculate it with live mycelium. We review it for proper growth characteristics, incubate it. And the beauty of the grain spawn, which was first um, um, developed in the 30s was that that bag of grain that you're seeing there has got thousands of grains there and each one is coated with mycelium. So when we break that up and mix it into a substrate, which is the growing medium, that it, it's a, a very good way to distribute mycelium and every one of those becomes a point from which the mycelium begins to grow into its a substrate. A lot of people think that the agaricus mushroom is grown on manure and, and you know, you, you probably heard the joke um, uh, about, um, well, 
they keep me in the dark and feed me bullshit. Uh, and, and that's kind of like, okay, yeah, I, I kind of get it. Um, it's kind of a funny thing. You, I've heard it a lot. But the, the fact of the matter is, is agaricus mushrooms actually grow on straw, uh, but we compost that straw. And so this is just kind of um, how you can see that, that very yellow straw being turned into a darker compost. Now it's supplemented with certain nitrogen and carbohydrates to activate the microorganisms that are doing the work for it for us but agaricus is grown on composted straw this is a common traditional agaricus mushroom house wooden shelves um, six high um, the cropping cycle from the time you actually put the compost in till the time the harvest is done is approximately 90 days. It is a um, one of those things where maybe a lot of you know this, but every single mushroom you've ever eaten has been harvested by hand. Of course, even the ones that you are hunting wild. But when we grow mushrooms, every mushroom has been touched by a human hand. And this is just uh, what happens in these houses. Here's a man, he's pulling them out of, and again, they're not growing out of the compost. It's, the compost is actually covered with a layer of uh, peat moss, which we call a casing. You can see uh, the mycelium in there. Now he has to trim off the bottom, uh, stick them in that one container. Then he puts the other mushrooms into the uh, basket. If you're seeing the mushrooms uh, in the store and they look a little bit dirty, it's not compost. It's this casing material, and it's not that easy actually to harvest agaricus without that. This is a more modern agaricus house, and now we have actual aluminum shelves uh, that has allowed for a, a tremendous amount of mechanization and the actual room itself, you're no longer in a space like uh, that man was. When, when I was working on the mushroom farm in 73, we had houses like this, and then we had more modern houses like we've just seen. But we used to use, uh, we didn't have lights in the houses. We had to use uh, miner lamps. So this is a, a standard uh, Garricus house. Now you can see the, the thousands upon thousands of mushrooms in every shelf, the agaricus will go through approximately three flushes. Every flush is about a week apart before that crop is finished and then gets uh, tossed out. Here you can see the very small, what we would call pins or pinheads uh, growing underneath there that have developed into mature mushrooms. And they're going through this house and what they're doing is they're selecting the mushrooms that are uh, mature enough to harvest, leaving the others. They'll come back in the next day and it'll take maybe five days to completely harvest off that crop. Now here's a little better representation of the mycelium that's grown into that peat moss casing layer. And, and that casing layer actually is protecting the compost from drying out. And that peat, we can water that so it's uh, got a lot of moisture in there for the mushrooms to grow into it. Mushrooms need a high humidity. That's very important. Um, another type of spawn is called wood, wood dowel spawn. And, and these, um, this type of spawn is basically we're, we're sterilizing the wooden dowels. We're inoculating them with live mycelium. We're looking at the growth characteristics. Uh, it takes about 30 days to fully um, grow those out. And those dowels are what are used in standard shiitake mushroom culture. And this is the traditional method for growing shiitake, which is on a, in this case, oak log. They're about three feet uh, long, about four to six inches in diameter. Uh, holes are being drilled every six inches along this log, uh, turning it a bit. And then these people are pounding that dowel into the holes that are drilled and then those holes will be covered with a bit of a, a, of a waxy type material. Um, the logs will then be set into a greenhouse and probably incubate for about 18 months before ultimately you'll see shiitake mushrooms growing on them. An oak log will last for 
uh, approximately four to five years. Whereas if you're going to grow shiitake on alder, like we might do here in the, the Northwest, um, you will, uh, that log will only have about a two year uh, life. Now this is uh, more of a traditional Japanese method where all the logs are outdoors. They're being um, soaked uh, after they've been fully incubated after about 18 months, they'll be soaked in the spring and in the fall. That soaking is actually what will trigger the mushrooms to grow, but this is a kind of a standard configuration in Japan. And you know what, what's going on in Japan and in China, which is really great, is that they are essentially growing with the season. They're not growing them indoors, uh, adding any sort of heating, cooling, humidification. They're growing it outside. The, the, you may have to come in here and water these logs by hand as you're going through the crop just to keep the humidity up, but. Uh, if you're in season, uh, the, the ground will be moist and uh, the humidity should be high enough. This is what a mushroom house looks like in China. It's just a shade cloth house. Inside there will be some um, um, uh, smaller greenhouses at times. The method right here that is being used for growing reishi mushroom is actually a short log. In this case, they've got about three logs pressed together. They actually will sterilize those logs, inc uh, inoculate them, incubate them. And now what they've done is in the ground, they have dug trenches and they are going to place all of these fully grown logs in those trenches. And they're going to cover them with, um, with the earth. Um, Unfortunately, this slide didn't work out well in terms of expanding it to the right size here. But, but you can see at this point in time now, this is after those logs have been covered. And now we see the beginning of these uh, reishi mushrooms starting to emerge. And, you know, it's really a beautiful sight when you see these red, uh, the, the yellow is, of course, the um, the growing edge of this stem of the reishi mushroom. And here the stems have come up, but they haven't begun to um, uh, produce a cap at this point in time. Now here's uh, a Chinese mushroom growing and he's got the log um, that he's pulled out of the, the earth forest showing a mushroom off of it. This, this log actually, they'll, they'll um, crop this for two seasons because it's a rather large log actually. The logs to, uh, can be one-year logs or two-year logs. This is a one-year log and this, you know, the thing I like about this too is that all of the uh, whatever happens to be in that earth is just growing alongside these reishi mushrooms. So you've got all of these different plants growing there as well. It's not just like this super, no, we're going to spray it and there's no weeds or anything like that. No, it's all there. So it's a very natural way of growing the reishi. Here, here's a, uh, a reishi flush. And normally with these, <clears throat> you will actually see how the logs have been uh, put into different rows and they'll be in very even rows. Here's kind of more of an example of how that works. They, they um, the, this to me, whenever I see these kind of things, I just think, you know, you, you can't really do much better than this in terms of growing mushrooms. As commercial mushroom growing, this is just a fantastic, yield and every single log has got one reishi on it. And that, that's actually what's happening here is that there is one mushroom growing off one log. And so as those come up, as we saw earlier, what happens is that there's two stems coming up of one log, they will actually prune that off so that they just get one mushroom and it'll be very uniform. And you can see they are just uh, wall to wall in these greenhouses. And one of the things that has gone on in China since uh, the first time I was there in 1989 is mushroom growing and mushroom houses have all kind of gotten a little bit uh, higher quality. And, and this is just an example of that. Now, now we've actually got a greenhouse that's more of a conventional type of greenhouse. They're still actually putting the log in the ground uh, but you can see how uniform this all is and how it's uh, 
a much nicer structure that they're using. Now, another type of spawn that is used is sawdust spawn. And, and that is just essentially uh, mixing up sawdust with a particular nutrient, adding water, sterilizing it, inoculating it with live mycelium, uh, incubating it for approximately 30 days. And then that sawdust spawn uh, is going to be used for any number of the different mushrooms that we're cultivating over there. And what's really interesting is that the majority of the medicinal mushrooms are wood decomposers. So there, there's absolutely something about this um, class of fungi, the ones that are, are um, growing on wood that produces more medicinal compounds than just mushrooms out of the soil or, or um, uh, out of the fields. Now, <clears throat> this is a sawdust log, and this is what's really replaced the standard three foot long, uh, three to six inch diameter log that used to be um, utilized um, uh, in Japan and China back in the day. And, and it's just not practical to um, actually take down trees and log forests for mushroom logs. So now they are using the sawdust and this is a very standardized sawdust log. And each one of those three places you can see on this log is where they have pushed some of that sawdust spawn into this log. And you can also see that the log is perforated to allow it to breathe. Mycelium has got to breathe. You just can't uh, clamp it out off. It will not grow without some oxygen. So it's actually taking in oxygen and breathing out carbon dioxide. Um, in this photo, you can see that where that spawn has been pressed into these logs and you can see the mycelium is growing out. And so ultimately a period of maybe, um, let's just say 60 to 90 days, that log will be completely colonized. And, and there are again, different um, mushroom house configurations. Again, going to a metal shelf in a metal building is a, a upgrade over a lot of the earlier methods of growing over there and the types of houses they're using, which are a little more simple. Um, so here they have incubated those logs in the house itself. And this is where the shiitake will actually grow in this house. Now, here's another manner in which they're going to grow shiitake, where they've taken all, the, all of these shiitake uh, sawdust logs, and now they've placed them in the ground in this uh, to set them on the ground. And, you know, the fact is, is rather than having a cement slab, they just have the ground there. The ground is, is moist, uh, providing them with a bit of humidity. They'll come in here and water from time to time. But this is just a, another configuration for actually growing the shiitake mushrooms. And, and the, these shiitake logs over the period of their incubation of about 90 days, that it's really interesting because shiitake will produce this brown pigment on it. And that's when you know that uh, it's mature enough to begin to produce mushrooms. Here is a, uh, another shiitake farm. In this, in this case, it's a shade house with these sort of mini greenhouses. And, and again, they can take those uh, uh, plastic um, on these houses inside. They can drop them down when they need to uh, maintain a higher humidity, for example, uh, pull them up when they need to crop them. But, but in case it gets dry or anything, that's uh, one of the functions of that. Um, this just kind of shows you the kind of flushes that come out of these houses. Um, shiitake is really a wonderful mushroom. Uh, um, I, I'm assuming most people have eaten shiitake. I, I consider it my favorite mushroom. It's got a wonderful odor, a wonderful flavor. And uh, I just think it's, in fact, in, in China, it's called shanggu, which is, which means fragrant mushroom. And, 
it's also just such a beautiful mushroom too. Here's one of the, the harvesters. This is probably the biggest shiitake farm I've ever seen. And it was in Taiwan. And they're just basically have these sawdust logs in a vertical position and they're just growing them in that manner. And they've got it here in this very large uh, house. Again, it's a little bit more uh, of a, it's not a, just a standard greenhouse. It's a little uh, higher value uh, growing house. Uh, that's just kind of the difference between Taiwan and China to some degree. These are maitake. And again, we've got a sawdust log. In this case, and I'm not really sure why they do this, but they do not use shelves for maitake. And it might have something to do with, with the amount of light. And, and you know, that's one of the other interesting things about mushroom growing is that the agaricus mushroom is just one of the few mushrooms that doesn't need light to grow properly, where of course, as you know, mushrooms do need light to grow properly. But uh, so that's where they're grown uh, when they're growing outside they, in these shade houses. They, they do not like direct sunlight, of course. Um, but anyway, the, this is my talkie and you can see the development of it from top left uh, over one and then uh, bottom left and then over one to the final maitake that is ready to be harvested. And here is uh, the mature maitake that is uh, ready for harvest. Here, here is an actual example of a, a mushroom that does not even need a shade house to grow. So they put these out and this is um, again they've got the small sawdust log right on the ground leaning against a, a wooden pole bamboo of course and um, with and 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 the, the thing that's happening in China when uh, in terms of growing mushrooms is that they're growing mushrooms according to the season so reishi actually is a warm temperature mushroom so it's actually growing all through the summer months and is being harvested the first week in September. Whereas most of the other mushrooms need cooler temperatures like somewhere around um, 20 degrees, 15 degrees actually, uh, 15 to 20 degrees, let's say. And, and that doesn't really happen until November. So uh, just like this one here, which is the uh, wood ear, auricularia, it is, this is outdoors, uh, again, right on the ground. The, the ground is very moist, uh, a good high humidity here. And um, it's uh, really, it, it's kind of an interesting mushroom auricularia. I have, you know, you look at it and you think, man, I, I don't know if I'd really want to eat that, but I've really come to enjoy it a lot. And they, they use it in so many different dishes and it's really kind of a texture thing. It's got a really nice texture. Not a lot of flavor, but but it's interesting. One of the things about being in China and traveling over there and eating, you you end up eating a lot of things that you wouldn't normally eat. Uh, and uh, auricularia is one of those things. This is uh, Tremella fusiformis. And again, the sawdust log on shelves. He's got them really tightly packed here. Um, and <clears throat> this is just kind of, again, a standard grow house. He's got like shelves, I think about 12 high. Um, and then here's another uh, house growing uh, tremella. And, and, and it is just such a beautiful fungus. I mean, it's just uh, amazing. It's another one of those uh, fungi that I've come to enjoy eating. This is lion's mane and lion's mane really likes cooler temperatures and the cultivated lion's mane looks fairly different from a lot of the lion's mane I've seen uh, in the wild, which is not very many. I've seen more pictures of them, but uh, this is the, the standard cultivated lion's mane over there and it grows uh, at about 
15 degrees. It likes definitely likes cooler temperatures. So it's actually being uh, produced and harvested in late November over there. And most of these mushrooms are being grown back up in the mountains and mountainous areas. And, um, you know, China is just such a, a very, very large country that uh, from top to bottom, I mean, you've got really cold areas. I mean, no different than like in North America, really, but cold areas and then warmer areas in the South. But most of the mushrooms that we're cultivating are sort of in the middle of China, but back in the mountains. I love this harvesting basket. It is just such a beautiful basket and it's just so beautiful to see it full of these lion's mane mushrooms, which it lion's mane is delicious. I don't know if people can get them. I, I know there's some lion's mane that it gets sold in uh, Vancouver area from time to time, um, but it's really a delicious mushroom. A lot of the mushrooms over there after the harvest are being sun dried. And that's just the traditional method of drying over there as you put them out in the sun. Again, I like that because it's very low tech, very natural. One of the things I love about mushroom growing in China is that it is a very natural type of production. It's not, um, when I was at the mushroom farm in the 70s, we're in big warehouses, they're all indoors. We have miners lights. It's completely controlled environment with uh, humidity, temperature, fresh air, all sorts of equipment that does that. This is all much simpler. And, and one of the interesting things about the drying over there is that um, mushrooms have uh, uh, the sterile called ergosterol. Ergosterol is actually a precursor to vitamin D so when you put mushrooms out in the sun, that ergosterol will actually turn into a um, pre-vitamin D. And, and today what's happening is that um, a lot of mushroom producers now are starting to go to um, air, um, forced air dryers, which means that all of those mushrooms that they were uh, putting out in the sun and that the were uh, getting a higher level of vitamin D. That's no longer the case with these mushrooms that are coming out of the, out of China. Most of them are going into dehydrators like this. Cordyceps, you've, you've probably seen uh, presentations by Daniel Winkler. What an interesting mushrooms. Uh, mushroom, this is from 1988 when it was still called Cordyceps. Now it's Ophia Cordyceps sinensis. Um, it is wild crafted in, in uh, Tibet and other parts of China. Um, it is actually probably one of the most expensive herbs in the world, uh, approximately anywhere from 15 to $20,000 a dried kilogram. Um, sometimes you hear people talk about prices even higher, but maybe you know, but that's just kind of like a hyperbole really, but that's it's still a very, very expensive mushroom way too expensive for the supplement market. And, and uh, I remember when I was trying to introduce these to the uh, North American market back in 91, and I was kind of showing them to people, to businesses, and uh, they just took one look at it and they just said, you know what, I don't think my customers are interested in eating caterpillars. So it was like, okay, there was not uh, much cordyceps that we sold back in the day. This is kind of how it looks after it's dried. They actually put it into really interesting packages for sale, but we don't deal with the wild cordyceps at all. Um, there's only two wildcrafted mushrooms that we work with, and that's chaga and uh, turkey tail. Uh, today, actually what we do is we cultivate cordyceps militaris, and cordyceps militaris has been used interchangeably with Cordyceps uh, sinensis uh, traditionally. So um, they learned how to cultivate Cordyceps militaris in the last uh, 10, 15 years. And this is, again, is one of the things I really love 
about what's going on in China because of all of their mushroom scientists there, they have brought a number of new mushrooms into cultivation. And Cordyceps militaris is one of those. So now um, instead of $20,000 a dried kilogram, our entry level Cordyceps extract sells for uh, wholesale for approximately $75 a kilogram. So you can imagine. Um, so now it's the Cordyceps is actually available as a, a nutritional supplement due to the fact that we can now cultivate it. And here just shows you the, the method that they use to cultivate it on a, a larger scale. This is a, a plate of Cordyceps militaris that I was fortunate enough to be served. And Cordyceps militaris is actually in the food markets in China. And it is absolutely delicious. Oh, it is, it is so tasty. Anyway, I, this was a great introduction to Cordyceps. You might look at it and go, what is going on here? Um, but it, it's beautiful. I love the deep orange color of it and it's got a wonderful mushroom flavor. Um, this is just a, a drying racks and just sort of, again, is the progression of how they keep upgrading every year their equipment and how they're growing things. Now, there is one uh, other method of growing mushrooms in China. And this is uh, this farm that we're going to look at right now is one of the most modern farms in the world. They grow uh, uh, in, in, again, very natural growing. And then this one is a standard indoors type of growing facility, but they're actually using liquid spawn. And so what they're doing is they are growing the mycelium in these tanks behind us there, growing it out. And then uh, this particular method of growing is now not in these autoclavable bags, but it's actually in a uh, plastic uh, container, this plastic bottle. This is, and it's totally mechanized in, in an amazing way. Um, I used to look at this, and this bottle culture was developed in Japan back in the uh, 1970s. And I used to think, man, that is just really dumb. Look at all those small little bottles that you've got to fill, you've got to empty, all the rest. But the fact of the matter is, is that actually mechanized, it, it's a really excellent system. And one of the things that it has um, allowed them to do as well, and here, the, here they are, they're capped, they're ready to go into the autoclave. They actually bring these out, they put them onto this line, and then they will inject the liquid with the mycelium into it, into these bottles. Each one of these bottles has a basic hole drilled right down the center of the bottle. So it just, they fill up that hole and it grows from the inside out. Um, um, this is the room where they incubate all of these bottles. And then once they're ready to start the mushrooms growing, they will take the cap off, they will take them into a, a grow room and the initiation sequence will begin. And this wonderful mushroom is one of my favorites, which is Pleurotus oringii. And here's another mushroom, which I consider to be just delicious, delicious mushroom. I love this mushroom. Um, but again, here, this method now is totally mechanized. It is inside now. Uh, in this case, they're going to have to do some harvesting by hand, but uh, I, they may actually put this on a line and have people harvest the mushrooms as they uh, come off. But what they normally do is they normally will try to get just two big mushrooms only off of each bottle. And this is what they look like. So normally, even when you see them out there, because I think most Oringii in uh, North America is shipped in from Korea, uh, normally you'll see just a couple, two, three very large mushrooms like this small cap, mostly stem, but uh, it is a delicious mushroom. 
here is uh, the farm where you saw the bottles that were being sterilized and inoculated and they use a shelf system indoor in the warehouse. Right now they're pumping in um, uh, moist air uh, to humidify, but you can see those bottles and just the um, how every bottle has got this family of mushrooms growing out of it. And um, th these are uh, shimeji mushrooms, uh, hypsigeus, and they're growing different, you know, the white and the, the brown one, but the, the colonization and the, the um, yield coming off this is just amazing. And, and this is where I had to really change my mind about this method. It's just like, wow, this is just amazing. Uh, if you ever wondered how they got those little flamulina enokis, uh, this is how they do that. They actually wrap those at a certain point so that they all grow up in this family with very long stems, small little caps, and then they will be harvested that way. And you'll see uh, enoki talking normally in those uh, uh, packages that are um, um, uh, sort of, um, what is that? The, well, they're, they're um, packed and the air is all taken out of the package. Now, the, what, what is really interesting here and, and what, again, to me was so um, advantageous in so many ways is you saw the harvester in the agaricus farm. And, and can you imagine what that's like facing beds of thousands of agaricus mushrooms and you're inside that house all day long, picking them one by one unbelievable the amount of labor that goes into that agaricus farm here now you've got simply a one flush and out uh, in this particular system so these um, are coming in from those houses a couple of men are simply putting them on conveyors they're coming into the processing area and what they're actually doing is they are pulling those off of the bottle, they're slicing off the bottom of it. They're then um, meeting them out into uh, packages, which are then being weighed, uh, uh, then being wrapped, then put in the box and away they go. Uh, it's, it's absolutely amazing how they, this system works and the the lessened amount of labor. And, you know, one of the things about mushroom growing is you need an army of harvesters. So any mushroom farm you've ever been to, especially in a Garricus farm, you have got hundreds of people that are working there. And the thing about mushroom growing is mushrooms never sleep. They are harvesting mushrooms 365 days a year. You, you, They've got harvesters in there on Christmas, on New Year's, on Thanksgiving, you name it, they are in there harvesting mushrooms. And that's one of the reasons why I decided that rather than uh, having a mushroom farm, I would much rather uh, sell uh, mushrooms in supplement form, which is dried powder. You can put it on the shelf, it'll hold its value there. You don't have to worry about it spoiling. So um, just to recap here, um, how are mushrooms cultivated? Well, we can either start with spores or mushroom tissue. We produce a pure mycelium culture. That culture is used to create our spawn, which can be either put on dowels, grain, sawdust, liquid. That then gets put into our substrate, which uh, may be sawdust, it may be the compost, it may be a wood log, um, and then we will grow the mushrooms off of that substrate. So. Those are uh, the basic, um, that's the basic manner in which we're cultivating mushrooms. Now, here is something you're probably mostly aware of the fact that morels are now being cultivated. And as you can see from the pictures, cultivated pretty amazingly in terms of the number 
of mushrooms that they're getting on these beds that are being cultivated out of doors uh, in long uh, um, earthen rows. Uh, morel spawn is actually, um, they're producing uh, sclerotia uh, and then they're planting all that in these rows. Um, uh, again, in China route right now, there's 120,000 acres of morel under cultivation, two to 3,000 kilos of, of uh, morels per acre. And in 2018, they, they produced 600 to 800 tons of dried morels. They still haven't actually perfected it, but uh, man, it looks uh, pretty good uh, to me in, as a mushroom cultivator. I just look at that and go, wow, that is just amazing. Um, and, and again, this is one of the things about China that I, I really love is that they are continuing to do so much research on mushroom cultivation and bring new mushrooms uh, into cultivation and, and to the market. This here is the shiitake mushroom temple. And this temple is uh, back in the mountains of Zhejiang province. It is, this is the province where Wu Song Gong learned how to cultivate shiitake. So they've actually uh, put up a temple to him in this county. It's called the Mushroom County of, of China. Their main crop there for this county is shiitake mushrooms. And uh, here is his uh, statue on the altar. And he has a, a shiitake mushroom in one hand. And then on the other hand, he's got this kind of interesting looking stick. Well, one of the uh, old methods that they used that they considered to be a way to get the log to start to produce mushrooms was after the incubation period, they would hammer it with a stick, uh, a good, you know, solid stick. They would beat on the log to um, wake it up, so to speak. And so he has the, the shiitake staff and uh, the mushroom there. Uh, this, this temple is just, I, I love going there every time I'm in China. If I'm in that area, I go to the temple. It's a beautiful spot. Um, and then this here is something that I also really enjoy. This is a reishi dragon. Um, everything there is made out of uh, Ganoderma with the exception of his head, but all of those uh, uh, growths coming off are, are uh, Ganoderma stems. And then of course we've got the uh, Ganoderma caps that are part of this uh, dragon. Uh, it's, uh, they do some very beautiful sculptures over there from uh, reishi mushrooms. And, and that is just a, an example of it. So at this point in time, I am very happy to um, take questions about any of the stuff that you saw. And uh, um, it's funny, I, I've got so many more slideshows, but that could be for another day. <laughs> but, and even putting together this one slideshow, the, the number of photos I've got of all of this stuff, I mean, you have to prune it way down because there's just so, so many. And I visited so many farms and I mean, we get our mushrooms from dozens of different farms, small growers. And one final thing I'd just like to say about China is, you know, I've been going over there since 1989. It's an amazing place. Uh, over the last 30 years or so, they've, they've brought 450 million people out of poverty. These small farmers growing reishi mushroom, which is one of the crops, that's one of the best cro cash crops in China. They're doing very well. It's normally a family operation. And um, um, today, instead of uh, traveling around China on, in some cases to get in the mountains on dirt roads uh, and uh, bumpy roads, and sometimes on a train that was just an old, you know, like a uh, very old train. Now we travel around on freeways that are better than anything we have. Uh, I'm on bullet trains that are going 300 kilometers an hour um, they, it's kind of one of those countries where they have just basically 
taken everything down that has been old except what they really want to preserve but they've just taken everything out which is what i saw early on in the 90s and everything now is very new um, our factory now that we we produce our extracts from is a brand new factory so much newness over there and and it's really for me it's really gratifying to see the the um advances that they've made and you know despite what you hear about china i mean i love um my friends friends over there they're really great people and and it really hurts me all of the negative press that is going on about china and it's really interesting because i was just reading something the other day and it said okay today in north america 20 percent of the people only 20% have a positive view of China. Everybody else has a negative view and said two years ago, it was like 60% had positive. Well, what happened in two years? I don't know, but I really don't like the way, uh, you know, especially the United States has to demonize everybody, you know? So at any rate, there you go. <laughs> that was terrific, uh, Jeff, absolutely terrific. Uh, if you don't mind, we'll take some questions. I'm going to first ask uh, Kurt to read us out the uh, chat boxes where they're asking questions. Kurt, will you come in and start asking? Yes, uh, JP asked, uh, what species of uh, morels were being cultivated? You know what? <laughs> um, um, it's not any species that you would normally no, it's a it's a different species, and you know what? I, I can't really tell you right now. I I actually reread that uh, what I have on them those morels, but but you know my memory did not remember the species <laughs> because they they've actually produced a number of different cultivars using various other species. But you can see from them that they they look very much like uh, Morchella conica actually, or something that's similar. But they have developed their own cultivars and uh, strains that they use for that. Uh, I could certainly get you that information though. And, and I could even post some, some more information about the, uh, what they're doing over there in terms of morale cultivation. The other thing, by the way, which is really interesting is they are now cultivating Sparasis crispa, one of my favorite edible mushrooms also. And that is just amazing to me as well. Okay, I think you've answered the, the second question, but again, as David said, so many people just thank you for the presentation. It was well done and very, very informative. Thank you. Thank Anybody you. want to ask some direct questions? Okay, well, there's one more that came in. The question is, is the field there, uh, Sorry. Sorry, sorry, Jeff. Um, okay, Ty, go, sure, go ahead, it's your question. Hey, Jeff, thanks again for giving the great presentation. I'm new to the club and uh, found it to be really informative. Um, I'm a farmer in North Saanich and uh, I'm just really interested in learning more about mushrooms just because they're everywhere on the farm and I want to find out which ones are poisonous, which ones aren't, and just all the basic information that goes along with it. But um, I was very interested by your morel pictures of how the... Uh, they just buried the log and then covered it in dirt. How are they kind of inoculating those logs in well, like the long rows? Well, actually what you were looking at were, were reishi logs that were being uh, put into those rows and buried. Those were not morels. Morels at, at the last we had a couple and, and they're actually, there is no actual substrate for the morels. They're just putting them into the earth. And the interesting thing about it when they're spawning the morels spawn they put the spawn into the earth and and you know make sure it's covered but but they can only grow on that piece of land for two to three years before uh, they've kind of exhausted the particular nutrients that are there for the morel and then they have to go move somewhere else but no those other pictures were actually uh, those logs that were used for reishi cultivation they are steamed in a autoclavable bag they are then inoculated with the reishi mycelium, incubated for three or four months. And then at that point, once they're fully incubated, they're putting them in the ground 
Uh, I believe they're putting them in the ground sometime around April. Uh, they'll take them out of the bag and then they'll place them in that row, cover them up with earth. And then, and you know, that in itself for me is just kind of a really fascinating technique because you can also grow reishi in those sawdust bags as well. And you can get it just to grow out of one end of a sawdust bag and get one mushroom off of that. Um, but the nice thing about the interesting thing about that log technique is it's very much like the agaricus where that, that, um, earth is acting like a casing layer. So what it's doing is it's maintaining the moisture of the log. And so you can come in and you can water those mushrooms as they're growing up with a, with a sawdust log. Sometimes what they do is after the first flush, uh, get it off the sawdust log, they'll come in and they'll stick a shaft into that sawdust log and pump water in there because what's happening is every flush, those mushrooms are pulling water out of the substrate and uh, you reach a point where if there's not enough moisture in there, you know, the mushroom needs a lot of water to grow. It's even with the agaricus, they're coming in there and they're watering the agaricus crop uh, and that peat moss layer uh, daily to keep the moisture up because those mushrooms are just, you know, you can imagine they're 90% water. So they're pulling all of that water out of that substrate and the casing layer is a, a, a way to protect the substrate and uh, put water in for uh, the development of the mushroom crop. Well, by thank, the way, you so, thank you so by much the way, for sharing. Yeah, One, I was going to say, David, just a second. I was going to say, I, I used to, uh, back in the uh, 80s, I consulted for a farmer on the Saanich Peninsula that actually had a small mushroom farm there. Great guy, <laughs> uh, small farm, ter having a terrible time getting a good yield. And I was there to sort of help him out. Well, I, I, that was going to be a follow-up question. And uh, I don't want to take up too much more of your time because I know there's other people in the group that have questions. But um, if you wouldn't mind sharing your contact details, I'd love, if, if you're doing consulting work right now, I'd love to pick your brain and uh, see if there's a fit there. Because um, we're always looking for new crops to add in on the farm. And, you know, we have the veggie crops down and the fruit crops down really well. But, you know, mushrooms are very rapidly growing um, portion of the market here in BC and, and I'd love to learn more and pick your brain a bit. Well, yeah, actually, uh, I'm not a consultant anymore, unfortunately. Well, fortunately for me, but, but um, and, and what I would say is there's some good books out there. One called The Mushroom Cultivator, right, Paul? <laughs> 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 which, which I would say that's a good starting point. And, 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 you know, if you've got straw and stuff like that, you can easily grow crops of oyster mushrooms and things like that. A lot of that information is in the book there. And, and there's, you cannot imagine how much good information there is out on the web now. There's, there's so many YouTube videos, <laughs> thank you, that you can, you can look at. And, and if you, if you want to know where to get spawned, there's a company out there called uh, Fresh Cap. They're over in Alberta and they sell mushroom spawn. And uh, there's, there's other companies around that will sell the spawn for you. And, and it's not that expensive. And, you know, with a little bit of straw, it's, it's pretty easy to grow some oyster mushrooms. After that, um, not so easy. And, and the one thing about mushroom growing is, is that there's, there's a lot of small growers out there uh, that are growing crops of mushrooms, selling them to restaurants and things like that. Uh, those growers are making about $2 an hour for their labor. It's a labor of love until you get to a certain point, a certain level. And to get there is like, man, you, you'd better have another job because it's, it's not easy. You're a babysitter. Uh, you're trying to grow these mushrooms. You have to do it in a regular way. The, the store that you're selling it to, the restaurant that you're selling selling it to, they don't want to see you every second or third week. They want to see you every week because if they put the mushrooms on the menu. Well, they want the mushrooms on the menu. Same with the supermarket. They give you space. It's like, well, so most people start out at a farmer's market or something like that and just sort of sort of get into it as uh, initially get into it as a hobby and then decide after that. But it's it's really tough as a small grower to make a living. Jeff, a medical uh, question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I noticed in the modern uh, facilities, there was ventilation. Uh, it looked like ventilation, but um, none of them were wearing masks. None of them in the production facilities inside, even the old ones, were wearing any masks. 
What is the incidence of mushroom growers' lung? Well, th that's a great question, David. You know, I mean, and, and that's one of the reasons why uh, agaricus farming is kind of doesn't have those issues because the agaricus is harvested as a button, as an immature mushroom. It has not actually grown up, opened, and sporulated. So, uh, you know, and one of the reasons they do that too is it gives it a long shelf life. You know, it's like you, you find a, a mushroom out there. If it's, you know, mature, it's not going to last very long. But if it's a uh, in an immature stage, you can take it home, you can keep it in the fridge for a couple of days and it's all good. Some of those mushrooms, like, like you're saying, like the shiitake farm and everything, I've seen uh, harvesters that are in fact wearing masks. Um, so that would be reasonably important um, in the case of some of those farms, they're not, and they probably should be because, yeah. because mushroom growers lung is actually an issue out there and especially uh, if you're in a totally enclosed environment and you've got all of these spores. And, and what's interesting is that a lot of that um, irritation comes from a lot of spores, as you know, can be ornamented with uh, um, little tiny spikes and, and things that, that are what will get into your lung and will just irritate the heck out of it. I mean, Paul, Kruger probably knows a little bit about mushroom growing lung. I mean, I mean, he's probably looked at it, but it's definitely something that that um, you have to be aware of if you've got an enclosed environment and you're harvesting mushrooms. You definitely don't want to be in there breeding spores. And right now, I mean, if you go into a Ganoderma farm and it's in a in one of these uh, greenhouses, and maybe it's open at the ends, but you can be in there and and when they are producing after they're mature, before they're man, it's a cloud of uh, of brown spores in there. Yeah, even the layers yeah. on top of the Ganoderma is not shining. It's all spores. Exactly. And of the things. E e exactly right. And you know, you know what they do these days is that they enclose those and they do not harvest them. They'll enclose them and allow them to sit inside and in, in very warm temperature inside these smaller greenhouses and just let them sporulate. And after 30 days, you will literally have uh, an inch of spores on the top of the cap and the, the underneath. In fact, in some cases, I got some great photos. They will actually put a plastic bag at the foot of the reishi mushroom and the spores will just sporulate right into this bag. And I have measured a bag of spores from a single reishi mushroom, 500 grams. Can you imagine 500 grams of spores coming out of one Ganoderma mushroom? It's amazing. Do they sell them? Sell the spores? I presume yeah, they yes, do. Yeah, yes, that's what they're doing. They're, they're selling them. It's a huge business in China right now. The spores worth more than the mushroom, believe it or not. You have time for a few more questions, Jeff. Yes, indeed. I, I, I've got, God, I'm in Tofino. I've got nothing going on. Come on. <laughs> Some okay. Questions. One of the questions was, what is the mushroom with the highest vitamin D or what species has the highest vitamin D? None of them. Okay. No, you know, you know, that's the funny thing because mushrooms have a very low amount of vitamin D in them. You really have to expose them to UV. So, so you could take a, a wild mushroom, for example, and they would probably have more D in them because they're outdoors. And if they get in season, if they get sunlight, they will have more D in, in them than a cultivated mushroom. But you could, if you bring them back home, uh, expose the gills. So turn them over, allow them to uh, sit in direct sunlight for 30 to 60 minutes. You can get them up to maybe uh, 100 IUs or something like that. So um, we actually are, in the midst of, we've got um, a, there's a UV lamp out there that's a high intensity flashing UV type lamp. And we're setting up for that right now. We're right in the process of doing it where we're going to be uh, using that to irradiate the uh, shiitake mushroom uh, powder with those lamps to create um, a high uh, vitamin D mushroom powder and we're, we're purchasing some right now from a company in the United States that's using agaricus to do that. And they're getting 
get ready, they're getting 40,000 IUs per gram of powder. 40,000 IUs. We've got a, we've got a vitamin D product uh, on the market that we're selling uh, retail. Uh, and it's, uh, I think in this particular product, we're just giving a thousand IUs, 25 milligrams, <laughs> 25 milligrams. It's like amazing. Um, so, and, and look, the, there's a lot of, there's a bit of controversy out there about vitamin D. Uh, is D2 as good as D3? And the fact of the matter is, is, is um, the research that's out there that's been done and by some of the world's experts on vitamin D will tell you that um, taking it on a regular basis, you're getting the same level of the vitamin D in your uh, bloodstream as D3. And, and what's interesting about D3, um, I looked into D3 and how it's being manufactured. Okay, it comes from lanolin, from sheep's wool. That's fine. I'm, uh, some people have a problem with that, so a vegan doesn't like that. But, but for me, okay, it's lanolin from sheep's wool. But the processing that has to be done to ultimately create the D3 is, is pretty harsh. It's a chemical process. And, and when you look at that process, you're kind of like, huh, that's really, I didn't think it was kind of like that. Whereas with the mushroom D2, all you're doing is taking the mushroom or the mushroom powder, you're exposing it to UV light for a period of time. That's it. Very, very natural process. And, and I really like that. And, and look, everybody should be taking vitamin D in a on a regular basis, especially in this climate. We're not getting generally enough D um, even in the summertime when you're exposing yourself, we're still at a latitude that's high. The arc or the, uh, of the sun is not uh, strong enough to really give us the kind of D that we should be getting. So a lot of people are running around deficient in vitamin D. There's a question from Bob. He's trying to grow lion's mane oysters and shiitake. Is there a good time to soak the wood uh, in the springtime or is, uh, and what type of woods, oak, birch, alder? Well, you, you know what, if, if uh, it really, you know, look, it's, it's whatever you have access to, but it, it should be a hardwood. Um, it, it does, you don't want a, a conifer uh, for any of those. Uh, so if you have a maple, uh, an alder, oak, something like that, normally how it works is you would, would cut that wood and those logs before it starts to bud in the spring. So right now you're kind of at the edge of, have I cut my logs yet? Because as soon as it starts to bud, all the sap is flowing out to the buds rather than being in the trunk itself. So that's when you wanna get them. Usually in February, you cut your logs and then you can go ahead and spawn them. But it normally takes uh, 18 months of incubation before you can actually soak them. And then you can soak them spring and fall and can possibly get two flushes from them. And, 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 and in, in British Columbia, I mean, it's alder. We've got a lot of alder out there. A lot of people just wanna get rid of it on their property or something, but alder is what I would recommend, unless of course you've got access to kind of a scrub oak or something like that. I, I mean, I know in, on Southern Vancouver Island, there is oak, but I don't know whether there's any oak that you can actually go out and harvest. Another question from Gary. In the cultivation in the open areas, do they have problems with turkey tails? I guess as an invasive mushroom. <laughs> you know, it, well, with the uh, um, shiitake growers, certainly they're, they're gonna be kind of like, you know, on the lookout, but you know, really in terms of the cultivation that we're doing, um, we don't really have any problem with, with turkey tail because, um, you know, once you've got that uh, sawdust, for example, fully colonized, you're pretty good. It's pretty protected by the, the fungal mycelium that has colonized that sawdust. So, so uh, you've got plenty of time to get your crop up. The thing that ultimately as you go through like a second flush and a third flush, uh, as that uh, mycelium is, gets a little more spent and tired, 
you'll have sometimes molds moved in, molds like trichoderma, green mold. Um, you can also get insects. There are what are called fungus gnats. They love mycelium and mushrooms. They can get into your crop. Um, there was a time when I used to import mushrooms from China, uh, whole dried mushrooms. And the United States has um, automatic detention on dried mushrooms from China. The reason was that back in the 80s, they had canned mushrooms or something and they had larvae in them. And so they put a detention on all the mushrooms coming out of uh, China and that included dried mushrooms. Well, I'm bringing in organically certified mushrooms. And do you think there might be a, a fly's wing or a leg or something like that? They made you do what they called a light filth uh, test, which is, uh, um, you know, checking out. It's in, in kind of a, you, you put this into some water and in, in with a filter and then the, the light filth floats up the top. Light filth could be a feather, it could be a beetle's head, could be a fly leg, could be a wing. In a certified organic product, of course you're gonna have something like that. So it, could, it would never really pass. It'd be lucky if I could get it in. One time I had to actually um, destroy 900 kilos of dried maitake. That was the uh, end of, one more, that was the uh, end of bringing any dried mushrooms. <laughs> uh, where, where can one buy some of your products? Is it marketed under certain brand names or certain stores? Oh, well, um, the reishi powder, I guess, is the main question from Anna. Yeah, um, well, first of all, my company Namex is kind of a business to business. We sell the powders wholesale, but we do have a retail side if you're interested in the products uh, retail, there's, they're only sold on the internet and you'd go to realmushrooms.com. So all one word, realmushrooms.com. And um, I, I'll, I'll see too if I can't um, grab some kind of a link that I'll send to David that he can post that will give people, you know, a certain, you know, I don't know, 10% or 15% or 20% off or something like that on, on anything purchase but I but the products are do ship uh, from Canada so there's none of the cross-border stuff really so if you order them straight off the website instead of like off Amazon or something. Jeff I think we really have to go but um, um, I'll put a link to Namex do you still have those excellent articles and all in your website? Yeah, and put a link there to Real Mushrooms too, realmushrooms.com, yes. David, and then people will do. Can, that link will be there. And and David, I'm just getting started. Come on, are you are you letting go of me already? You're pushing me out the door? God, I, I tell have you, to shut you I, up th somehow. I thought you were more polite than that. Come on. <laughs> never, <Jeez>. never. The board <laughs> you mean, knows you, otherwise. <laughs> you mean this is over? <laughs> Anybody else for a Tofino isolate? <laughs> Many of them uh, don't know that, uh, you know, what a mataki is but out here on the West Coast. They're really? very common out in the Midwest and East. Oaks, lots of them. Oh, wow. Lucky you. Yeah, we used to. Not anymore. I'm out here in Victoria, as you know. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to thank you very much for a very interesting and informative talk. That's fantastic. Uh, you're very welcome. It's been my pleasure. And thank you from all of us at SPIMS. Yeah, and I'm sorry I haven't been able to get down to any forays or anything like that. I'm kind of just trapped here in Tofino. Yeah. <laughs>